Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Matt Graybaugh. I am the science coordinator for the Desert LCC. We're very pleased today to have a group of presenters talking to us about modeling and decision support tools they've been developing for environmental flows in the Colorado River Delta. Starting us off today will be Jennifer Pitt of National Audubon Society. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Hi, Matt. Thanks. Uh, and I just want to let people know that with me today presenting will be uh, my collaborators on this project, including Eloise Kendi with the Nature Conservancy, Leanne Doherty with Hydros Consulting, and Karen Schlatter with the Sonoran Institute. And it's been a great collaboration, and you're going to hear from all of us as we talk about what we call the integration of, da of data and models uh, for the Colorado River Delta. This is a project that really was born out of a U.S.-Mexico agreement called Minute 319 to the U.S.-Mexico-Colorado River Treaty. And Minute 319 uh, went into effect in 2012 and led to uh, some environmental flows. We um, developed this project in order to have some predictive tools um, for, future, for potential future flows. And we are grateful to the DLCC for support of this project. It wouldn't have been possible without that support. Next slide. Oh, um, it may need another click, Leanne, but I didn't realize we had animation, but there should be, oh, go back, sorry. Um, the first slide is a satellite photo of the Colorado River Delta, uh, just showing you that we're down where the river meets uh, the upper Gulf of California. Next slide. And I just wanted to cover briefly that the Colorado River Delta historically was a vast ecological resource with uh, perhaps as much as a million acres of wetlands. That was based on the fact that virtually all of the Colorado River historically was flowing to the sea. That's about 15 million acre feet. Um, we believe that the river's influence may have been as much as 40 miles down into the sea, and that created an extensive estuary that was one and a quarter million acres. Next slide. Today, of course, the story of the Colorado River is one of extensive development by water users in the United States and Mexico, resulting in the fact that not very much water gets down to the Colorado River Delta. So here you're looking at uh, actually a Google Earth image of the river hitting the furthest downstream dam on the river, Morales Dam. You see then the river takes uh, what looks like a left turn on your screen, and that's uh, water flowing into the beginning of Mexico's irrigation system. But what you see, if you follow the course of the river directly uh, downstream, you see the remnant Colorado River channel in a very diminished flow that is actually just seepage from the dam gates and a little bit of groundwater seeping into the channel. So you see a very um, emaciated river remaining. Next slide. And of course, what that has resulted in is in places a truly desiccated channel, absence of a river, and that has in turn led to a considerable invasion of non-native uh, trees, salt cedar, displacing the native habitat, principally cottonwood and willow bosque forests. Next slide. Uh, in the late 90s, the conservation community, a number of conservation organizations, uh, started working together with some collaborators from academia talking about the possibility of some restoration in the delta and started making the case for adding 
flows back to the delta to both protect remnant habitat and perhaps do some restoration or revitalization. Next slide. And that, I'm fast forwarding through a lot of history, but that is ultimately what led to Minute 319, which is a broad-ranging agreement between the U.S. and Mexico, but among its term, many terms for water sharing includes commitments to flows for the purpose of rewatering the delta. And the points I wanted to make here are that those flow commitments were informed by the early science discussions that were going on with the conservation community and academia in the late 90s. And in those discussions, a concept emerged for the, how a very small amount of water could um, be useful for the delta. And the concept was a pulse flow. And that is an occasional flow. And its purpose is to inundate and scour the floodplain, uh, causing native seeds to germinate and revitalizing habitat. And that pulse flow would be paired with a base flow. And the base flow is a more regular flow and its purpose is to provide water to sustain existing vegetation and to create open water to promote food sources, in other words, insects for the wildlife, the birds that use this region. Um, in total, the um, estimates from those late 90s discussions were that less than 1% of the Colorado River's uh, historic average flow would suffice in this pulse flow, base flow regime. But it's also worth noting that ultimately, when Minute 319 was signed, the uh, volume of water dedicated to environmental flows in that agreement was less than the estimated need from those early studies. Um, and uh, nonetheless, we did have this new agreement that allowed the US-Mexico to collaborate in delivering flows to the Delta for the first time. The big uh, pulse flow was delivered in 2014. And I'm now going to hand it over to my colleague, Eloise Kendi, from the Nature Conservancy to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, let's switch the slide. <clears throat> so, Although most of this presentation is going to be about a model or a, a linkage of models, um, I wanted to begin by a little touchdown to reality and just walk you through very quickly what it was like to actually see the pulse flow. So on the top of the slide is, a, is the Morelos Dam. And this is when they first started raising the gates and the very first water emerged. And you can see people up on top watching, and there were crowds standing where I was standing, taking pictures and watching the water come down. And then the next day, there was, a, there was a ceremony on top of the dam with all kinds of um, speakers from high up in government agencies from both sides of the border. And, and the picture on the lower right is just a sprinkling of the, the press that showed up for this. So it was, a, it was a really big event in Mexico as well as in the United States. Um, next slide. So after, um, after the water got released, um, my colleague Peter Warren and I, and as well as I think it was Dale Turner who was taking the pictures, went down to watch the water come. We went to the first um, hydrologic monitoring site, and you can see us standing next to the staff gauge, ankle deep in water, because this is, this is where there's a little bit of groundwater that maintains um, wetness in the channel, and we're waiting. And, um, if you'll click again, you'll see the same um, angle, or no, a different angle of the same location. So this is the same water level at the same place, but we're just not in the picture anymore. And you can see um, a staircase going down to the water. So keep your eyes on the staircase and the railing to the staircase. And go ahead and click again, Leanne, and you'll see how much water came down. It was it was huge. This was in the in the upper reaches, and the water came up actually even higher than we had anticipated. Oh, God. Um, click again. So even as that was happening upstream, this is what was happening downstream. The water was just creeping along um, through the dry reach that, that Jennifer showed you earlier. 
And you could literally walk faster than this water was moving downstream. You could easily walk faster because it was seeping into the, the sand so fast. And yet, just a little ways upstream, like the end of this picture, was it was a pretty good, you know, respectable sized creek. And as you saw in the previous slide, just a little ways upstream from there, it was a huge river, meters, many meters deep. Um, next slide. So even as everybody was excitedly watching the water coming down, the scientists were hard at work um, monitoring. So we had scientists from a number of organizations, um, government agencies like USGS here doing uh, uh, hydrologic work. We had NGOs, um, the Nature Conservancy, and Sonoran Institute, Pro Natura Noroeste, and academia like University of Arizona, um, and UAB, Universidad Autónimo de Baja California, UABC from uh, Mexico, um, and many others monitoring the hydrology, the surface water, the groundwater, the, doing the um, repeat photography. Um, the picture kind of highlighted in the center is Karen, one of our speakers on this presentation, um, counting cottonwood seedlings. Um, we had people monitoring birds and water quality and, and all kinds of things. But, um, and, and, and really got some great scientific data, which was fantastic because the last time the river had any water in it of any substance was back in the 90s and there was nobody there to monitor it. But all the different um, teams that were doing their monitoring were not really linked together. So we had some great work on hydrology, some great work on vegetation and so forth. Um, definitely advanced the understanding of the ecologic and hydrologic impacts of the pulse flow, but those pieces were not linked together and they couldn't be used in a decision-making mode. So that's what prompted, uh, next slide please. Um, that's what prompted this um, project, which is an integration of the data and the models that were generated by the binational science team. So the overall goal of this the pro project was to develop a tool that would predict the hydrologic and ecological responses to different environmental flow deliveries that might be released from Morelos Dam. Um, Specifically, the predictions that this tool can make are what the flow hydrographs will look like at downstream cross sections at different times after the water is released or even during its release, um, the maximum extent and depth of inundation everywhere, um, the places where new areas of open water would be created, um, the potential to support existing existing native vegetation as well as the potential to establish new vegetation. So that's what we're going to be talking about during this presentation. Um, now I want to make a quick disclaimer that of course um, this is a model and these results are based on the limited data sets and tools that were available to us. A few months ago we presented a more detailed version of this webinar to the binational science team and they provided uh, very useful feedback which we've incorporated into the IDM. So today's webinar is intended to introduce the IDM or integration of data models to a broader audience who may be interested in the progress that is being made towards restoring the Colorado River Delta or who may be interested more generally in linking hydrologic and ecological modeling to improve restoration outcomes. Next slide. So here's a quick overview of what you'll be seeing. Um, the model consists of a delivery scenario, so how much water is delivered at Morelos Dam at any, on any, in any hour, I guess. Um, and then that information go, is input into a hydrologic model, a transient HEC-RAS model, and that model output is input into an ecological model and then the output of that model is um, the predictions about the ecological outcomes. Um, and, and output from the, the overall model is actually 
formatted as input to a, in an infiltration model, which simulates flow through the entire dry reach. But because that model was only very recently completed, the geographic scope of this presentation is limited just to the, the um, IDM, which just models the limit trope as shown in this picture. Um, the limit trope is the 31 kilometer reach of the Colorado River that forms the international border between the United States and Mexico. The first, like about 10 or 15 kilometers are wet with shallow groundwater as I mentioned before, and the entire rest of it is dry because of excessive pumping of, from, of groundwater from the underlying aquifer. This dry reach continues for about 35 kilometers downstream, and below that is where most of the, the restoration sites are located, where groundwater again comes to the surface. Um, during the pulse flow, less than 10% of the water that was released in the upper reaches actually made it past this big groundwater cone of depression to the restoration sites. Um, let's see. I, before we move on, I just want to point out, if, in case you haven't noticed, at the top of the screen is the Morelos Dam, so that's where the water was released and and the way the, and where the model releases it as well. Um, and then at the bottom. And the southern edge is what's called the Southern International Boundary, or SIB, which is right at the city of San Luis, Rio Colorado. Okay, next slide. And this is, this is one more picture of um, during the pulse flow, waiting for the water to, to come down before it completely inundated this area. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leanne to describe the surface hydrology part of the model. So actually, this is Jennifer, and I'm going to um, just quickly tee up how, um, how we were using scenarios in the policymaking context. So the first thing to note is that, as I mentioned before, the volume for minute 319 and the pulse flow itself was negotiated in a U.S.-Mexico agreement. It, I would say that it was informed by science, but ultimately the volume of water that was assigned to the environmental flow in minute 319 was defined by the negotiations uh, in, um, because the environmental component was part of a set of trades that the U.S. and Mexico were making to come to a mutually beneficial agreement. Um, we then also went through a planning exercise for a successor minute to minute 319, and we call that minute 32X. It is not yet an agreement, and we don't yet know what number it would be assigned, hence the X. In that planning process, we essentially did feasibility level planning. The negotiators for the two sovereigns, the U.S. and Mexico, asked our technical team to assess a range of flow scenarios based on a range of volumes that they thought they might want to consider in their negotiations. And so we looked at those scenarios to determine potential impact or benefit. Um, if there is going to be a new agreement between the United States and Mexico that commits to future environmental flows, there will be another round of actual flow planning. So all we've done at this point is some um, feasibility level planning uh, in anticipation of a new bilateral agreement. Uh, another thing I just wanted to point out about the flows sort of um, changed our thinking a little bit um, between the initial exercise leading up to 319's flow, the pulse flow, and future flows is that um, for minute 319, which by the way has a five-year scope and it expires at the end of this year, uh, the instructions in the minute were really that the purpose of the environmental flow was to determine its hydrologic and ecological impact, primarily that um, understanding that flow, knowing that it was the first dedicated environmental flow, that, that the primary purpose should be to learn from it. Um, I believe, while we don't have final language on a next minute, there is some drafting work that has happened over the last few years, and we think that minute will extend, if it 
is in fact passed would extend through 2026. Um, we think that the purpose of the flow would be more emphasis on creating the benefits, including ecological benefits, recreation benefits, et cetera. It, which is not to say we're not still trying to learn as we deliver flows in the future, but that the primary emphasis has shifted now that we have some learning behind us. So now I think I'm turning it over to Leanne with Hydros Consulting, who has um, been a key instrumenter of this uh, IDM tool. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so we went ahead and the whole point of, of building these, um, this IDM is so that we could run future, potential future environmental flow delivery scenarios to see what the potential benefits would be. Um, and, and like Jennifer said, it would be more focusing on the ecological benefits at this point um, than necessarily testing all the different types of um, hydrographs that we could possibly um, release from Morelos. And so the, the scenarios that we came up with, um, we, we of course um, looked at the 2014 pulse flow, um, which as you can see in the figure is the gray um, line. And so that's the release from Morelos um, that happened um, between March and April um, in 2014. Um, so we, we use that one as our kind of calibration point. Um, so this, this whole project is really based off of one data point, is this pulse flow. Um, but we were pretty, um, in a sense, confident of, of the results that we've gotten just from using uh, these data. And so from there, we wanted to look at a few more scenarios that could maybe bound um, the different ecological results that we might see. And so um, the first one, we, or I guess the second scenario, we were calling the 30 CMS peak scenario. Um, this is our, what we're saying, our operational constraints scenario. And so we say that it's a reasonable expectation of future environmental flows uh, given the operational constraints at Morelos. So the releases, the maximum releases, um, the maximum decrease uh, of flow from Morelos in any given day. And so we use that as our operational constraint scenario, which you can see is the blue line um, in the figure. And so along with that, we wanted to see, okay, if we could um, not have any operational constraints at Morelos, um, you know, what would the model tell us and, and how would the system respond? And so we came up with this slow recession scenario, um, which we're calling our hypothetical scenario. Uh, it's the best case delivery for habitat restoration in these models, um, although if not physically possible at the moment, it would definitely take some policy and operational uh, changes to implement, but we wanted to see what how the system would respond if we weren't constrained by these things. So like I said before, these three scenarios kind of bracket all the likely future scenarios um, that at this point we could potentially see um, for our ecological responses. So the first thing that we did, um, and I'll just go over this very briefly, but we used the transient surface hydrology model um, to see how the flows from Morelos would flow through the reaches um, down to SIB. Uh, this model is uh, a HECRAS model from, um, we, we received the model from UABESE, it was a steady state model, and we turned it into a transient model. Um, they had input all the geometry and done a bunch of calibration um, for the roughness coefficients, and so we were able to take it and pretty easily turn it into transient mode. Um, our inputs then became the release hydrograph um, at Morelos that you saw in the previous slide. Um, so for each of those scenarios, um, that was the hydrograph that was input at the top of the model. And then for the output, um, we were able to get flow hydrographs at um, each of the cross sections um, in the downstream locations, and mostly we were interested at looking at the um, comparison of the discharge measuring stations um, so that we could calibrate better uh, as we went along the, the reaches. We also were able to get the inundation extents um, at each hour and also the maximum inundation extents, um, and then able to see the, the depth of the flows um, at any location um, at any time. 
So from this model, um, I kind of just went over the outputs, but this is what it, um, the outputs look like. Um, first, focus your attention on the yellow line, which is the 2014 pulse flow observed um, flow. And now I should mention that this, these are hydrographs down at the SIB, at the Southerly uh, International Border. And so this is at the bottom of our model. Um, this is an important point because we wanted to see how well we could calibrate the model to the data that we had. Um, and also because SIB is an important recreational point um, where water benefits uh, are highly coveted. And so the yellow line is the observed hydrograph at the at SIB, also known as GMS4. Um, and then the blue line is our modeled uh, 2014 pulse flow. Um, now, at initial glance, it does look like they don't match up very well. <clears throat> but you have to remember that this is at the bottom of our model, and so um, we have a rough, um, we, we roughly model the infiltration, um, and because of that, we end up getting not quite the same peaks um, of volume as the observed, and also a little bit of, uh, uh, not a lag, but a, our arrival time of the flow is a little bit earlier than the observed data. Um, but overall, for the one data point that we have, um, we feel that it reflects pretty well um, what happened in reality. And so from there, we took the model and we ran the other two scenarios, which we have our 30 CMS peak, uh, which is the orange line. And we also have our slow recession uh, scenario, which is the gray line. So like I said, the, um, the SIB is, um, or the, the bridge at uh, San Luis is very important for recreational benefits. Um, very interested in um, aesthetics and recreation um, around the bridge. And so we wanted to know how many days um, of water would be at SIB. And so we compared these numbers. And um, it's more a matter of that we are able to get these numbers and compare the relative amounts of time that um, water will be at the bridge. And so as far as the days go, um, when comparing the 2014 pulse flow, um, what we observed at the bridge is about 28 days in the same time span. Um, we, re we got about 33 days. And so we weren't too far off. Um, and just knowing that in the future, we can use this as a, as a gauge or a benefit um, from each of the scenarios. So the other important results that we got from the transient model, um, like I talked about already, are the maximum inundation extent, so how much flooding happened along the channel, um, where that flooding was located, and then also the maximum flow depths. Um, and flow depths really at, at daily um, time intervals. And so I'll show later uh, how these will be related uh, to the ecological models. So the next big piece that we did, um, our, our transient hydrology model, um, those results go into our ecological models. And we looked, um, we built three different models, <coughs> which we'll go over individually. Our first one is looking at new areas of open water. Uh, we wanted to know where areas of uh, new habitat would be possible for aquatic and migratory birds. Um, and then the second one, we wanted to see how each hydrograph, each scenario would support existing uh, vegetation. So the native vegetation, including willow, willow trees and uh, cottonwoods. And then the third one, we wanted to see um, what the recruitment potential was um, for these native species um, with each scenario. So our first model, like I said, um, was looking at the open areas, the newly created open, newly created areas of open water. <clears throat> um, these are good for um, aquatic and migratory birds, and um, it was really interesting because uh, the increase of open water from the pulse flow um, also saw an increase in bird abundance um, during that time, and so that we know that's an important factor down in the delta. <clears throat> And so what we did is we compared the um, maximum inundation for each scenario, so where the extent of water went, 
to where the existing water already was. And this layer, as you can see in the map um, in the shaded blue, um, that came from a LIDAR vegetation map that Jeff Milliken from USGS put together. Um, so by overlaying these areas, we were able to see where the new areas of open water were created. Um, and so our, in terms of our results, we saw that um, the observed new areas of open water from the 2014 Pulse Flow were about 1,900 acres, and our model um, f saw about 1,700 acres. And so just on a magnitude scale, we feel like we got really close. And um, just to note that the observed uh, acreages came from Dr. Jorge Ramirez from UABESE. So there's a lot of collaboration of data collection that we use within our model. Um, and then we can see that our other two scenarios, which had a less, much less um, lower peak, um, were about 500 and 400 um, newly created areas of open water. And so then that just gives us a sense of um, what kind of magnitudes of open water would be created by what kind of peaks. So our second model, um, Karen um, from Sonoran Institute, will uh, discuss this. I just can everybody hear me? Hello? Hello? Oh, we're muted. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so firstly, I just want to also mention that at the beginning of this project, I wanted to give a little bit of credit to Matt in helping to, Matt Graybaugh from the Desert LCC and in, in helping to develop some of the concepts for these models at the start. So um, getting now into our model that predicts where we would have support for existing vegetation. Um, and when I say existing vegetation, I'm specifically referring to native vegetation, so cottonwood and willow habitat. Um, we use these species because they are key natives that, that are foundational species in riparian habitat, and we're currently um, using these species in restoration efforts in the delta, and they're, they're target species of ours. So um, for this model, we used vegetation maps, again, created from Jeff Milliken of the US, US Bureau of Reclamation. Um, using LIDAR and spectral imagery. And we were able to overlay those maps, so habitat type of cottonwood and willow, and overlay that with our areas of inundation to predict where existing habitat would be supported by these different flow scenarios. And I'll throw out a disclaimer that um, this isn't the most accurate way for determining how flows will support existing vegetation, but given our, our tools and data, um, we think this is a, a realistic and, and good approach to estimating um, support for existing vegetation. And so using this approach, we did make some assumptions. Um, so firstly, that inundated trees, so any flows that inundated these, these areas of existing cottonwood and willow habitat, those trees would benefit from inundation. Um, we didn't include a limitation of the duration of inundation. Um, and then we also assumed that existing habitat outside of the area of inundation would be supported by recharge. So that water infiltrating into the aquifer would, would benefit those trees outside of the channel. Um, and we didn't put any sort of boundary or limitation on, on how far away from the channel those existing trees could be um, in order to benefit from recharge. So I will say also that, that during the 2014 pulse flow, we observed green up both within the areas of inundation and outside of the area of inundation. So I think um, you know, this model approach was supported by, by the data we saw from the pulse flow in 2014. Um, so in our results table here, the summary table, um, you can see the amount of acres that are inundated, so these are the amount of acres of existing cottonwood and willow habitat that were inundated under each scenario. And then the third column there, recharge, that is the amount of acres outside of the area of inundation 
that was we predict is, is going to be benefited um, by infiltration of, of water. And then the total amount of the volume of water that is recharged into the aquifer is provided on the column on the right. So um, a few key things, um, just that recharge is, is much higher in the 30 CMS and slow recession um, in terms of the acreage it can support. Uh, and that's largely due to the lower flow volumes that are being provided and, and the lower peak flows. And so you're, you're getting more infiltration and more support for existing habitat. Um, next slide. OK, now I'll move on to the third model that we developed, which was our recruitment potential model. And um, recruitment is basically referring to the process of germination and establishment of seedlings over the growing season. And again, we targeted cottonwood and willow species for this particular model. Um, you'll see on the photo on the left, this is a cottonwood seedling that germinated um, from the pulse flow. So this is a seedling we saw um, in our first monitoring session after the, the pulse flow release. And there's been an extensive amount of literature and studies done on cottonwood and willow recruitment requirements. And so um, they have a few key ecological requirements for germination and survival over the growing season. So firstly, um, germination requires moist soils and bare substrate. Um, for establishment and survival over the growing season, there has to be a fairly gradual stage decline from a pulse flow or any sort of flow in the growing season. And then additionally, they need a shallow groundwater table um, to support that habitat that's newly created. And so cottonwood and willow extract moisture from soils. And as uh, surface flows recede, they need to be able to follow the, the water um, that's receding in the soil, moisture, in the soil profile and, and develop quickly enough. Um, in arid regions, they need to be able to reach the saturated soils above the groundwater table. And so if you have a, a very quick uh, recession of the surface water, and if you have a very deep groundwater table, you're likely to get seedling mortality. And so um, using ecological criteria that already existed um, in the literature, and then additionally including some uh, results from the 2014 pulse flow, and in, in development with support from Pat Shafroth and Matt Graybaugh, we were able to come up with a range of values for, for each factor. And so then we combined the criteria to produce areas where we thought we would get uh, recruitment of high or medium or low potential. Next slide. OK, so for the development of this model, we created a multi-criteria evaluation model in GIS to evaluate potential. And basically what we did was, was we created different layers in GIS um, to incorporate the hydrological model results and then additional hydrological and e ecological data into our model. And we developed all of the input layers um, to represent each factor in our model. So for depth to groundwater, we used um, data that was from 2015 uh, from the University of Baja California and Pernatura, as well as the Bureau of Reclamation. And we created an interpolated groundwater surface that was the maximum depth of groundwater over the growing season, as this is a limiting factor for uh, newly established seedlings. And then there are additional uh, model inputs that Leanne is going to talk about. Thanks, Karen. So the second piece um, that we focused on <clears throat> was developing uh, stage recession rates. And so um, what we actually are looking at is, like Karen was saying, um, we're looking at the gradual stage decline. And what we're interested in is the decline of the soil moisture profile um, 
so that the, the seedlings can become more established. Um, but we need to use a proxy for that since we didn't model the soil moisture directly. Um, so we used the results from the HECRAS, the hydrology model, um, the stage results, and we created HECRAS stage recession rates um, that we used as a proxy. Um, just to note that uh, even though this is a proxy, it's a common practice in many other studies in the literature, um, as well as the software uh, HEC EFM, um, another um, co uh, our core uh, software that uh, looks at ecological benefits. And so we developed these um, rasters of stage recession rates that became input to the model um, that we then uh, looked at different categories of the recession rates along the, the thaw leg. So the third piece um, is a result that you've already seen. We just wanted to see where the moist soils are going to be. And so um, for our results, we took the maximum extent of inundation directly from the HECRAS model for each scenario. Um, and that was kind of our bounding factor of where uh, estab establishment could take place. And then the fourth piece was you need bare ground um, for the seedlings to establish. And so this bare ground layer came from the LIDAR vegetation maps um, that we've been talking about produced by Jeff Milliken. And I said that incorrectly earlier. He's uh, from the Bureau of Reclamation. And so we took just the bare ground, um, and that also became an input um, to our model. And then I will turn it back over to Karen to discuss the results. OK, so looking at some of our model results, um, this is specifically for the slow recession scenario. So this is kind of our best, um, the, the, the scenario that gave us the best ecological results. And note that on this map you see here on the left, there's not a whole lot going on here. So this map shows uh, model results when we included the bare ground criteria. Um, and because the limitrophe area of the delta is currently densely vegetated, uh, primarily with non-native species, um, we found that that severely limits the area of recruitment potential. Um, so what we did is we actually we took that criteria out, um, which would basically simulate what would happen if you uh, did vegetation clearing along the, the floodplain prior to a flow release. And so this next map on the right shows areas that would have recruitment had there been uh, vegetation clearing. So you can see a combination of low and medium and high potential recruitment areas. Next slide. And here is our summary table for the recruitment potential model results. Um, you can see here, so in the high, medium, low total acreage column, those acreages are not particularly high. So this is a combination of, of all areas of recruitment and ranging from zero to seven acres. So um, not particularly high. And then the linear extent ver is variable for each scenario as well. Um, and just a reminder, our, our total study area is 31 kilometers. Um, and all of these values are values, um, outputs, when we removed the bare ground criteria. So this is assuming that there is bare ground along, along the floodplain. Um, when we did include the bare ground criteria, uh, results for all scenarios were basically less than one acre or zero acres of recruitment potential. Um, and so this might be a little bit discouraging, but in general, um, we should also kind of put this into context. So there, when you have a, a flood flow, um, generally there, there's a fairly narrow ribbon of establishment that occurs. Um, it's not going to be a huge area of recruitment unless you have just a catastrophic flood, um, which is not what we were modeling here. So it's going to be a narrow ribbon. And then um, additionally, I wanted to point out that in the 2014 pulse flow scenario, we have a fairly small amount of acreage, but a large linear extent. 
and that was just because it was a very scattered response, um, so little tiny patches of, of establishment occur occurring, but in a very small area. So what's going on here? Um, it was interesting to see that you know we were getting these different results based on um, the spatial factors. So in the upper, upper limit trough, we found that recession rates were actually a limiting factor. So we were getting too high of recession rates in the upper part of the river channel just due to the channel narrow, narrowness of that portion. Um, and then in the lower limit trough, on the contrary, it was depth of groundwater that was really the limiting factor. Um, there's very deep groundwater tables as you get further down in that, in that section. Um, we were able to tease this apart a little bit further by conducting a sensitivity analysis where we altered groundwater depths and we increased all groundwater. Um, we increased our groundwater inputs by varying degrees. And then we also did a reclassification of our recession rates um, to make it more favorable. And in doing this, with our combined changes in groundwater depths and recession rate reclassification, we were able to increase the total uh, recruitment potential area by about a factor of 10. So um, this tells us that you know, there is potential for recruitment, but current conditions are actually quite limiting. Next slide. So as I just mentioned, current conditions are, are limiting. As, as they exist right now, um, perhaps passive restoration is not the best approach to get effective restoration in the limit trough. Um, so we, the cool thing about this, this tool is that we were able to look at how, not only how to optimize flows, but also how we could incorporate um, different management actions to get more effective results. So one thing we would suggest for a future modeling approach would be to do some channel modification uh, in the upper limit trough and see how that would affect recruitment potential. And of course, also try it, try it out on the ground in the delta. Um, also, base flow deliveries could augment groundwater levels in the lower limit trough. And then, of course, it, it's looking like without any vegetation clearing, we're going to have very little uh, recruitment. And so um, in summary, you know, we concluded that the limit trope may be better suited for planting of stakes and cuttings or, you know, implementing some of these other more active management approaches prior to flow releases. Next slide. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Thanks, Karen. Um, just a few conclusions and then hopefully we can have some questions. Um, you know, one point we wanted to make is that the tools that were developed here have already been used in the policy process, in the technical work group that was advising the United States and Mexico in the Minute 3QX negotiations, we were able to bring these tools to bear in the scenario planning process. And that was really um, gratifying to see that we could using our science in progress uh, real time. Uh, and of course, now that we, and we have done a fair amount of work uh, since that time over the last year, and uh, this tool is now ready. And should there be future flows, uh, could inform how those flow hydrographs are designed. So not only at the scenario uh, planning stage, but also as a future team, by national team, might be working on actual hydrograph planning for environmental flows under some future United States and Mexico agreement. Um, and then the final point we wanted to make is that, uh, you know, with this model, optimizing flow benefits will, of course, always be an iterative process. And as more releases are made and more data points are collected, that informs the model. We can use that to improve the model and also uh, spit new results back out of the model that will then be uh, informing subsequent uh, potential flow releases. Uh, so that's where we are in this process. Again, we want to thank the DLCC for support. It wouldn't have happened without you, so thank you. 
And I think with that, we're ready to take questions. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to, again, remind people that um, we have a presenter mode going on here. So if you'd like to ask questions, please enter them in the, the group chat box down at the bottom. And I see we have a few already. Um, I wanted to start it off by asking a question. I'm not sure who to direct this to, um, Jennifer. Um, but in several cases, it seemed like the lower peak flow uh, scenario would be more beneficial for things like uh, the days of flow down at San Luis Rio, Colorado. Um, one thing I, I didn't see presented is a, a comparison of the overall flow of volumes. So do you have a sense of what the total uh, difference in total water volume would be um, between, say, the pulse flow and the, the slower recession model? I'm going to get Eloise to answer, but I will first say that in all of these scenarios, including the actual 2014 pulse flow and our experience over the, the scope of minute 319, which is 2012 to 2017, remember that, it's, that environmental flow deliveries are comprised of both base flows and pulse flows. And so any um, scenario modeling that's been done combines, it, it's a trade-off between how much water you invest in your pulse flow and how much water you invest in your base flow. And we have not shown you what the balance looks like. Um, but uh, I would say that our model, our, our assumption is that in the um, future scenarios, not the modeled 2014 pulse flow, but the future um, volumes, while the volume in the pulse flow itself might vary between scenarios, the overall amount of water being applied might be the same. So Eloise, do you want to add further definition to that answer? Jennifer, I don't have the volumes that we modeled. I, I know that the um, pulse flow was 105,000 acre feet, but Leanne probably has the volume of the other two scenarios that we modeled. I, I do. So actually, um, what we modeled um, for the 2014 poll, so we modeled um, 83,000 of those um, coming from Morelos. And then um, our other two scenarios were a bit smaller because instead of volume, um, we were focusing more on the recession rate and being constrained by the, the peak flow. And so um, our 30 CMS peak scenario um, a total release of 21,000 acre feet, and our slow recession uh, scenario saw a release of 32,000. Um, and so these we saw as kind of bounding um, what could potentially be the total volume that um, would be negotiated for 32x. Um, and also, like I said, it was more focusing on the ecological benefits um, by refining the, the recession rates. Um, and that, you know, the decline um, at the tail end of the, the flow. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. So it's uh, roughly uh, less than half of the, the flow to get the lower uh, flow rate scenario. So great. OK, um, we have some other questions coming in, uh, first from Julia Fonseca. Uh, the question is, how was infiltration and recharge estimated? Eloise, you want to take that? Yeah, I actually answered it in the chat, but I'll, I'll do that again. Um, the infiltration rates were not modeled. They were basically input. And it was the um, infiltration rates that were measured during the 2014 pulse flow. So that's a huge approximation. We know that if we have a lower flow, then the if we have a lower magnitude flow, then the infiltration rate may be lower. But if we have a longer duration flow, then the infiltration volume may be longer. We really need to get more data in order to calibrate that. Um, that's one reason why also we were hoping to link this model to another model that was specifically developed to model infiltration. It's called a diffusion wave model. and it um, and kept, it captured the entire dry reach. But that model only just got completed very, very recently, so we weren't able to link it to this one. And that's why we have um, 
formatted the output from this model so that it can be used as input to that model. And if there were, I guess in a future project, we could actually do that so that we could better model the infiltration and recharge. But to answer your question, we just use the, the measured values from the 2014 pulse flow. Great. Thank you, Eloise. Uh, the next question we have, um, let's go down the list here. Uh, the question is, if reliable flows are put into the river, what guarantees that the water stays in the river and is not diverted? Um, I'll take that one. Uh, so Mexico has one diversion point, and it's the uh, diversion dam that I showed you in that Google Earth image. And so there really isn't uh, another place where Mexico could pull water out of the river. Now, of course, there's always the possibility that some rogue irrigator puts um, a pump in the river and pulls water out. But, uh, you know, Mexico has its national water agency with active enforcement on the ground. And um, when that uh, behavior has been observed in the past, in the, in the times when there have been some flows in the uh, river channel, uh, you know, enforcement is called out, um, and illegal diverters are, are not permitted to persist in that activity. Okay, thank you. Um, move on to the next question. Um, when you talk about recession rates being the limiting factor to the recruitment potential, you mentioned the narrowness of the channel and being a fat factor. Can you talk more about why that is? Eloise, is that for you? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, okay, the channel's really narrow, and you've got a huge volume of water. Now, compare that to if you have the same volume of water in a really wide channel, and the, the water starts and, and the, the delivery drops off, and so the water starts flowing downstream. If it's a really wide channel, then it's not going to, the, the water level is not going to get as high during the flow. Um, and the water level will recede more slowly. Um, if you have a narrow channel, then the water is going to stack up a lot higher during the flow. And when it stops, it's going to, the level will recede a lot more slowly. Now, if you have a wide channel, the, the um, area that gets exposed is going to increase faster. It's hard to explain. You kind of have to just think about the geometry. Does it make any, sen any more sense now? <laughs> Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she says yes. So thank you, Eloise. Um, okay. To me, it makes sense. Okay. So um, we have some more questions. We're running short on time here, so I'll work on prioritizing. Um, key question here from uh, Tice is, are there any opportunities in the Limitro for agricultural return flows or water transactions with agriculture on the Mexico side? So um, I'll address that and just say yes and that there already is a water trust that is operating and acquiring water through transactions with um, irrigators, and that trust is delivering water to restoration sites in the Limitrove, to restoration sites downstream, and uh, as well has been used to deliver water at Morales Dam. Matt, I'm kind of answering questions as I can in the chat line too, and so is, Ka so is Karen. I know, Eloise, but we um, we need you to answer them audibly so we can have it for the recording. Ah. Do you want to ask another one, Matt? Sure. So um, let's take a final question here before we wrap it up. And this is actually, let me see. Okay, final question here, and I think this was somewhat addressed already. Um, but is there proposed work to improve the calibration of the model with the 2014 pulse flow as the baseline? Well, this project has ended. We've, we've used up our funding. So um, there's not any proposal at the moment for further developing the model. But it did calibrate the model to the 2014 pulse flow. What we would like to do is calibrate the model to future flows so that we can improve both the model and, more importantly, the efficiency of, of water delivery for producing ecological outcomes.
if anybody's talking, you're you're muted. With that, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for, for attending and participating on this call, and especially thank you to all four of our presenters for taking the time to do this today. Um, as a reminder, the webinar was recorded, and it will be made available on the Desert LCC YouTube channel. Uh, you can access that channel through our website or find it simply by searching Desert LCC YouTube. And once again, I want to thank everybody for attending, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you.